This is episode 71 of the Fitness and Post podcast. To access the show notes for this episode, please visit fitnessandpost.com slash 71. This episode is sponsored by editstock.com. EditStock provides high-quality, uncut film footage for those who want to learn or practice the art of video editing. This cool service offers raw footage from a variety of genres, including action, comedy, sports, and documentary, so you can pick the same kinds of projects you're looking to get hired for. EditStock offers professional feedback on your work and even allows you to use your cuts for your demo reel. Multi-user educational licenses are also available. Visit editstock.com today to download a free sample scene and use the code FITNESS to save 10% on your order. This episode is sponsored by Cinemodi. Cinemodi produces high-quality, royalty-free, and post-friendly second-unit stock and visual effects footage for filmmakers. You can find their second-unit collection at cinemodi.com. That's C-I-N-E-M-O-T-I.com. And as a listener of the Fitness and Post podcast, we're offering you an exclusive 15% off discount code that's good for any order. Just enter FIP15 during checkout. Again, that's FIP15 for 15% off any order. My name is Zach Arnold. I'm a film and television editor and the creator of Fitness and Post. I've spent many years working brutally long hours in a dark room and battled numerous health problems due to the sedentary nature of my career, and that's what led me to building Fitness and Post. Whether you work in post-production like me, or if you're a designer, programmer, animator, composer, or anyone working a sedentary job all day, we'll help you learn how to sit less, focus more, eat better, and bring health and wellness back into your life. You spend all day fixing it in post, now it's time for some Fitness in Post. Hello and welcome to the Fitness in Post podcast where it is my mission to help you optimize the most powerful operating system that you have, yourself. My guest today is Dr. John Rady, MD, a clinical psychiatrist and professor of psychiatry at the Harvard Medical School, if you've heard of it, it's just this little, little tiny school out in the East, as well as the author of such groundbreaking books as Driven to Distraction, Recognizing and Coping with ADD, Delivered from Distraction, Getting the Most Out of Life with ADD, and the book that I'm very excited to talk about today, Spark, The Revolutionary New Science of Exercise and the Brain. In our conversation, we dig deeply into the mechanisms in the brain that are activated when you exercise or even when you move more throughout the day. We talk about stress and anxiety reduction, depression, and we dive deeply into ADD and how it can be reduced with movement and exercise. And more importantly, we talk about what is happening to your brain when you don't move throughout the day, and even worse, if you're overweight or obese. And I've got bad news for you. Having a spare tire around your waist is the least of your problems. For those of you who enjoy this episode and find it fascinating like I do how movement and exercise can actually make you smarter, then you would be a perfect fit for the online course that I'm completing now titled Move Yourself. Move Yourself is an online learning course, kind of like lynda.com, but for your health, that over the course of five modules and 25 plus lessons will show you how to sit less, focus more, and become so active at work that you'll never feel guilty for skipping a day at the gym again. And in addition to five modules worth of lessons similar to today's episode, it will also contain over 50 activity videos from certified yoga instructors, chiropractors, and even a few from yours truly that will help you alleviate the chronic pains associated with being sedentary all day long. So if this course interests you and you'd love to be a part of the second beta phase that I'm opening very soon, just visit fitnessandpost.com and join the mailing list. I'm only going to be sending private invitations to mailing list members at this time until the course goes public. And now, without further ado, my conversation with Dr. John Rady. I'm here today with John Rady, the clinical professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. And I swear to God, if I had Elvis on the other end of this microphone, I would be less excited than having you here, John. So thank you so much for being on the show. Well, with that introduction, I love being here. Uh, It's great. That's great. Well, as my audience knows, I'm a bit of a brain science geek. I have no formal training or formal education in any of it. But when a lot of people in their free time will go to the movies or go to the bar, I'm sitting reading books about neuroscience. So your book specifically, Spark, the Revolutionary New Science of Exercise in the Brain, was one that I came upon 
I don't know, maybe three or four months ago. And it was an absolute life changer in the way that I look at brain health and movement because I'm developing an entire online learning program to help people learn how to move more throughout the day in their environment and not always think to themselves, well, I have to get to the gym five days a week to be healthy. And the the two are really not that connected. So the, the reason I wanted you on the show today was to explain to people how exercise works with the brain. So uh, before we get started, can you just give us a little bit of a background in kind of your your official background as a, in psychiatry and medicine and how you got interested in this topic specifically? Yeah, I, I, I guess it starts where I, I was an athlete all my life, so I was always uh, aware of the benefits, but not consciously aware of the benefits of exercise and what it did for me. But then uh, in my training in psychiatry, I was at, came to Boston and I've been here ever since in the middle of the 80s when the Boston Marathon was getting legs, as it were, and Bill Rogers was running and we had won, the U.S. had won a silver or a gold medal in the Olympics in 70, or 82 in the marathon. So we were more aware of running and, and uh, began to see patients who had to stop running in the 80s. And, and so they had to stop running because of an injury. What we saw was first they came out and they were depressed. Then a number of them showed up with uh, what we call attention deficit disorder. And that led to a whole career in writing about, exploring, talking about treating attention deficit disorder and knowing full well that one can self-medicate, and these people were doing it. They had never known they had it uh, until they had to stop running because of an injury. They had, they had to stop their seven miles a day, which was a constant steady part of their diet, and all of a sudden they couldn't get anything together. They, they had a harder time managing their, their feelings. Their temper tantrums arose. They would forget things. They would insult people and things that were never part of their life before. And uh, so it became very apparent to me that exercise was really powerful. Uh, also, about that same time, we were beginning to learn that exercise scientifically had an effect on mood and on anxiety and on stress. We were beginning to measure the effect of exercise there. And uh, and that's sort of been was very calmly interesting and people in science and medicine were you know every every month there'd be about 10 papers in the literature uh on exercise in the brain but it really took off in the 90s when a study was published looking at running mice and compared it to non-running mice so for seven they're talking about teaching them to run in a running wheel having them go seven days 10 days test them before and after their test scores went up 20 to 30 percent. They looked at their brains. Their brains were thicker in the top part of the brain, the cortex, where uh, a lot of our thinking really occurs. And at one part of their brain was bigger. And this led uh, the hippocampus, which is sort of the center for memory and learning. And it was bigger. Uh, just with uh, for, for a mouse, seven, seven to 10 days is a long time. But they were trained. They, they had really made their brain grow, and they were smarter. They had this, this stuff called BDNF was higher, two to three times as high as it was before they began. So this, this was a revolution. This really was the start of the revolution. This was in the mid-'90s. And from that time to now, we have learned so much about the brain and its exercise effect on it, such that every week I get sent over 100 articles, every week, 100 articles from the National Library of Medicine or abstracts of the articles to, uh, that, that talk to the new articles published on the effect of exercise on the brain. So we know that it this started as a way to help us talk about preventing Alzheimer's disease, preventing what we call cognitive decline, which is what happens as we age. And we prevent that by exercising. And, uh, and it's one of the surefire ways of doing that. And that's what this study and showed, uh, that it improved the ability to think and learn of, of these mice 
but it also helped preserve their nerves and their brains over time. And this has uh, been repeated again and again and again, both in animals and, and many, many times now in humans. Uh, and we actually see if, we, if we're middle aged and you begin to exercise and you've never exercised before, you can prevent the onset of cognitive decline by as much as 10 to 15 years. And in some cases, some centers show that you cut the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease in your life in half if you stay with it, if you stay with exercise. And that really was the revolution. That's what I, because that just was like, wow, we are seeing exercise change the brain. Wow, this is incredible. And then we led into its effect on all the emotions, uh, all the brain functions got better uh, as well as we, so I say that exercise helps with uh, regulating our emotions and optimizing our brain, brains to learn. All right, well then let's just jump right in, go right down the, the rabbit hole because my assumption up until a few years ago, and I know it's clearly the, the common assumption of most people in society as well, I know that exercise is good for me and I know I'm going to be able to burn calories. And if I burn more calories than I ingest, then I'm going to lose weight. And there's this thing called runner's high, but, but that, that's really all that exercise does. So can you just dive a little bit deeper into the actual neuroscience behind how activity, movement, and exercise are actually changing your brain? Sure. What happens when we, uh, and, and it really goes back to evolution. When we evolved as hunter-gatherers, over 200, 300 million years, we developed our big brains. And our big brains developed to help us be the best movers that we could be. That we were the evolutionary victors because we could plan, predict, we could sequence, we could abstractly consider things, our working memory expanded. And we used those same cells that we added on over millions of years. We use those same cells to think with, to imagine, to sequence, to write papers with, to figure new activities out, new challenges. We use our moving brain such that our thinking brain is really the evolutionary internalization of our moving brain. So it, in other words, that when we move, we're activating our thinking brain. And this all points to the big, big, huge benefit of what movement does. Now, along the way, what happens? When we begin to move, our brain cells fire. In fact, we use more brain cells in moving than in any other human activity. And when the brain, what we mean by using them, that means the brain cells are firing and they're releasing neurotransmitters. And the popular ones are dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. Most people have heard of serotonin because of Prozac and dopamine perhaps because they pay attention to the stimulants and addictions. Um, but early on, we were fascinated with norepinephrine because it had so much to do with mood and mood disorders. And so when you're moving, you're increasing the concentration of these chemicals, these neurochemicals. So I say and have said that a bout of exercise is like taking a little bit of Prozac and a little bit of Ritalin or Adderall or whatever the popular stimulant is of the day because it does the same thing. It releases and increases the concentration of these neurochemicals as well as a whole array of other actions on the brain that are all positive because we evolved expecting to move. Our hunter-gatherer forebears were moving 10 to 14 miles a day. So our genes are sort of expecting us to move and move quite a bit, but we're not doing that. We're sedentary. And so when we begin to move, we activate all the good stuff that says, okay, we want to grow this organ in, in a big move uh, in, in thinking really in neuroscience about 15 years ago was starting for us to start to think of the brain as a muscle, as a, like our muscles, that the more we use it, the better it gets. The more we use it in a way that's targeted, the better it gets. So the more we're learning, it, it gets better. But when we're moving, we're really using our brains. So they get sort of think of our 
uh, you know, each each of our hundred billion brain cells as as a bicep, and you're doing curls on your biceps to get it stronger and tougher and more resilient. Well, that's exactly what happens to our brain cells. That that that's what we see. They get better. They get tougher. They get they improve in what's called their neuroplasticity, which is a huge concept uh, that we didn't know about before, uh, before 1988, really, uh, that our brain cells actually grow. They get bigger uh, as we use them. And so this is what I call now the, the high point of optimal living is getting our brains to the highest level of neuroplasticity that you can because you'll deal with the emotional regulation to get there, as well as you'll optimize those brain cells to grow. And that's the only way we learn is for our brain cells to grow. Yeah, and that was really the big discovery for me, the the game changer was the word neuroplasticity because I just always assumed that you're born, you are who you are, your IQ is fixed, and then I found out, wait, I've been spending all these years trying to you know, sculpt my body and go to the gym and worry about my waist size, but then I thought, wait, I can do the same thing, but with my brain, and I don't have to deal with all of this brain fog and lack of attention, because I've been very open with the fact that I've suffered from suicidal depression, ADD, and it's something that I still fight with every single day. But really, what manages all of these things for me is constant movement throughout the day and exercise, which you mentioned, uh, Prozac and uh, Ritalin and Adderall. And you said, well, it's kind of like taking a hit of that, but can you actually go a step further? Because there is actual science that shows they are equally effective on a chemical level. Isn't that the case? Oh, yes, yes. So certainly uh, with uh, mood, mood, I mean, Hippocrates, 300 years B.C., wrote in the first medical text that we have uh, talking about various diseases, and he talked about depression, and he said the best way to treat depression is to go for a walk. And if they come back, if patients come back and they're still depressed, he'd send them out again. You keep walking. You keep moving. And now we know what goes on. We know that the brain changes when we're moving, and it changes greatly. So uh, studies have been done all over uh, the world, started really in a, in a big scientific way at Duke University Medical School when they began to observe their cardiac rehab patients who were exercising for maybe the first time, that had a heart attack or were in danger of, they put them on treadmills, and the psychologists and the psychiatry department began to say, hey, we're seeing these people get less aggressive, less type A, more type B. They are less depressed. They're less stressed. And they, so they began to do studies. And, and studies came out almost yearly looking at a group who they started exercising who was depressed. Well, and 1999, they published a landmark study, really, of 100 people who were, came into Duke over a four-year period complaining of mild to moderate depression. They volunteered to be in the study. They divided them into a bunch of groups, one group essentially getting exercise, and all these people were sedentary, exercise three to four times a week for 40 minutes, coming in, getting up, getting their heart rates up to about 75, 80% of their maximum eventually. And another group who were given increasing doses of Zoloft, one of our Prozac-like wonder drugs for depression. Well, after four weeks, all the, the people in, bo- in all the groups that they looked at who were having the intervention did about the same. They, they dropped their depression level down to become undepressed. They followed these people out for 10 months, and those people who continued to exercise did not have any reoccurrence of their depression, whereas the people who were on drugs, who were on medicine, did. There were a number of people who had a recurrence of their depression, probably because they stopped taking their medicine, which often happens when you're using antidepressants, but no one's ever, they they, they didn't drill down for that. But since then, I mean, there, there was scientific evidence, and that's been repeated with placebo and and really carefully done. University of Texas, who did another study, but now studies all over the world 
in England and now in, in Asia and in Korea and China, they are very much looking into this and finding the same kind of effects so that you do have an immediate effect, like people that were as depressed as you say you were back when we were being suicidally depressed at one point about 30 minutes of exercise will make your mood better up to about two hours. You'll feel better. You'll feel less stressed. You'll feel more vigorous. It doesn't last until you do this repeatedly. You know, is do it again and again and again, and you get it going for two to three weeks, and then you see, uh, you can see the, these changes in your mood and your stress level and your self-hate and all the stuff that goes along with being being depressed. Well, and I think that to go even a little bit further talking about how you said, well, you can't just exercise for 30 minutes and that replaces the pill. You kind of have to do it more often. Speak a little bit more to the idea that with an antidepressant, it's 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 taking care of the problem momentarily, but it's actually blocking the brain's ability to fix itself, which the brain is very, very good at that most people don't realize that there are so many mechanisms in the brain where, you know, talking about things like neurofeedback, where you can actually just show the brain, here's what it feels like to be in an optimal state, and it will rewire itself. So just explain a little bit how when you're taking the pill versus exercise, the difference between the temporary versus the more permanent fixes. Well, I think with the permanent fixes, I mean, what we know is that you begin to, when you constantly are stimulating the, the, the brain cells themselves to in, in the movement paradigm, in the movement activity, you are causing those brain cells to get bigger, meaning you're, and better. You're getting more enzymes made to make more neurotransmitters and, and to make more receptors on the other side of the synapse. You don't have to know the structures. It's just that you make them bigger and better. And so you build the brain that way so that, you know, that you're, you're, you're going to achieve being less depressed and less likely to get depressed in the future, especially if you keep it up. Now, a pill, yes, they're wonderful. They're magical when they first came on board, and they still are. They save lives and, and help people, and, and help people hopefully to get to the point where they begin to exercise and then eventually not need the pills to, uh, as they begin to, to really change their brains. And so, you know, it, it's, it, it's not like these are replacements. These are both and. It's not either or. It's not a simple thing with the patient. You... You need the medicine sometimes, and you need to change your brain as well. Now, in another issue, attention deficit disorder, which I've written a lot about it because I have it too, and my partner, Ned Alloa, has it as well, and that's why we wrote the book, Driven to Distraction. And so and we always saw that exercise was a huge component of, of good management and good treatment. And there are studies coming out galore all over the world, Taiwan, South Korea, a bunch of places in the U.S., a bunch in Canada, showing that exercise with people, kids, adults with learning issues, that is with attention issues or with reading issues, they get better with chronic exercise, maybe even replacing the medicine in many cases. In some cases, there's no question you have to use medicine, but it, it depends on the severity. Like you say, you've been managing your own ADD, as I do with uh, exercise, you know, and, and when I don't exercise, uh, much more likely to be ADD-ish. So that promotes uh, sort of a self-generating need to exercise to keep myself under wraps. Yeah, and I've I've certainly been on that hamster wheel as well, no pun intended, um, <laughs> where I was on Adderall for a certain period of time. It must have been nine or 10 years ago now when I was, I'd come out of the, the suicidal depression and I'd kind of balanced myself, but then all of a sudden I'm thinking, I just, I cannot focus on anything. I have these crazy amounts of anxiety and stress. And the description that I gave to my doctor, and this is where he just clued in, is like, I know what's going on. I said, listen, I feel like I have this machine 
inside my chest and it's just spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning and I can't turn the machine off and I'm either going at 150 miles an hour or I'm going zero miles an hour and I don't have a middle speed. Those are the only two speeds that my brain worked. But he said to me, and this is where I realized that I was working with a very different doctor, he said, you need to start exercising. And I'm thinking, I just assumed you were going to give me a pill. But he had a much more holistic approach to it. So what I started to learn, and this is really where my journey with brain health began, and it's so counterintuitive to most people, but when you have attention issues, and I would guess there's a fairly large amount of people listening to this and in my industry that deal with this, you think, oh, well, I'm bouncing off the walls and I'm hyperactive and I have so much energy. But your brain is actually functioning on a lower wavelength and is trying to catch up. So can you explain the mechanism a little bit that's going on with attention issues? Sure. I, I think we know it from, from many different angles. We know it from the wave issue, as you mentioned, but we also know it from at, at the synapse. At, you know, we have 100 billion nerve cells, and, and some of them are involved in the attention system to regulate our attention. And they are very sensitive to the medicine that we use, the stimulants, but the, they're sensitive to coffee, to nicotine, to all the drugs, uh, cocaine, all the drugs of abuse as well. And what we see is that we, when we build up and make them tougher, that our attention system gets better so that we uh, actually see this in animals. And we see this in humans because we test for the holding their attention, sort of maintaining their focus, as opposed to being distracted and not staying with it, being frustrated and, and giving up or throwing a fit. It, you know, if there's exercise involved, they will have a much better result of staying on it, staying with it, getting through it. And uh, medication helps, but uh, exercise helps quite a lot. Yeah, I found that exercise actually worked for me way, way better. And I had a pretty extensive background in athletics growing up as well. And I had done martial arts and basketball and baseball and football and I uh, had done all these different activities. And it was funny, I had the same experience where you talked about with uh, the runners where they stopped running and started experiencing all of these symptoms that they, they had never seen before. The same thing happened to me in college where I, where I was super active all the time. And then all of a sudden it was just all about studying. And I just it literally stopped everything. No exercise, wasn't paying attention to diet. And within probably probably a couple of weeks, I couldn't even function. And I'm like, what is going on? I've always been a high performer and always had plenty of focus and energy. And I had been consistently active every single day for almost 10 years and just cut it off like completely out of my life and had that same profound effect. And then did the same thing to myself when I moved out to Los Angeles and started working. And that's when I had the suicidal depression because I literally was not moving at all. Like I would wake up, get out of my bed, walk to my office because I was working from home and that was it. If I had a Fitbit back in those days, I probably would have had less than a thousand steps a day and it almost killed me because I wasn't moving. So I've, I've definitely had that experience. And kind of going one step further with the idea of ADD and ADHD, another thing that I dealt with a lot, and this is something you talk about in the book, is how people with ADD are stress junkies. And they need to put themselves in a place where in order to focus, they need to be under immense pressure. And that's the way that I lived for years, where I would intentionally procrastinate, 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 until I had so much work to do in such a small period of time I just became a laser focused machine and knocked everything out, which is great until you deliver it and you completely crash. So can you talk a little bit about those mechanisms? Sure. What you're doing with the stress, I mean, you know, exercise is stress on the brain, okay? And, and intense exercise is intense stress on the brain. And you, so you're getting the same kind of effect in a very different way, in a much more manageable way, as you did with the old procrastination theme of, of waiting to the last minute so you, you know, the sort of Damocles is over your head and so you have to stay with it. You, you're, you're impelled to stay with it. You, uh, you, your, your brain is turned on. And what we're seeing with, with uh, exercise and play and, and being in, in, a, in movement is that our brains are really turned on and it turned on in a, in a healthy way as opposed to getting the stress hormone and all the uh, adrenaline up for too long 
and uh, too intense, and and then you crash uh, when when you're done. With exercise, you're doing it more gradually, and you go into recovery period rather than crashing. And then recovery period and and recharging that leads to growth. That leads to growth. You just think about it for your muscle, and think of the brain as a muscle. When you exercise, when you're doing squats or lifts or whatever you do, you're really damaging your muscles. You're really stressing your muscles to a, a big degree. But then you go into recovery period and and repair period, and your muscles get bigger. They get tougher. You can lift more. You can do more. In the same way with our brains, it it's uh, you know you're stressing and straining. You're demanding more from your brain cells. They respond, they grow, they get tougher, all is good. I want to transition back to the idea of exercise and brain growth again, because you had mentioned very briefly earlier in the show something called BDNF. And I want people to really understand how powerful daily movement and exercise can be for the growth of their brain. And you've actually called BDNF, which is brain-derived neurotrophic factor, miracle grow for the brain. So what does this mean, and how can I get miracle grow for my brain? Right, right. We wish we could. In fact, my colleagues in psychopharmacology say, leading into the mental hospital now, they, they would like to have a like a spray shower uh, spraying out this this BDNF on patients as they walk through the doors because it's so good for everything that the brain has to do and then repair and, and recovery from the mental illnesses or whatever. And so basically BDNF was discovered in the mid-80s and it is a factor that we now know is produced when we use our brain cells. That is use provides a feedback loop to turn the genes on to make more of this stuff. And what does this stuff do? Well, this stuff causes our brain cells to be healthy. It does it through a variety of different channels that we know about to be perky, to be ready to grow. The interesting thing is that we knew about this in the mid-90s, and we talked about it in relationship to aging and keeping our brain cells healthy. And that was a big drive. I was like, how, how can we increase this uh, BDNF to make sure we don't have brain erosion and, and leading to Alzheimer's disease? Well, in depression, we see the same thing occurring as we do in rapid aging, if you will. You see the brain shut down. It's not as plastic. And then this is what you, the word you love, neuroplasticity, meaning that our nerve cells can grow. And if you have the fertilizer there, they grow. it grows better, it grows quicker. It's more responsive to the, whatever your need is to use those brain cells for. And it, it really has a, a magical effect on the brain. And, and, and like, for instance, in depression, we really, uh, about 15 years ago, we were beginning to say, oh, when you get depressed, your, your brain is less neuroplastic. In fact, when you're depressed, you can't learn much. You're, you're not paying, not only not paying attention, you're, you're not taking things in, in from the environment nearly as much. Well, consistent with that is your BDNF is much lower. Your stress has overwhelmed your BDNF, if you will, or it just shuts it down. So then they began to, to look at, at our antidepressants and saw that our antidepressants raise our BDNF. And in fact, well, and, 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 but, but even early on, it was hard for the people in, who were studying depression to say exercise had this magical effect of raising BDNF actually two or three times more than our antidepressants or our antidepressant drugs that we use. And, and nowadays, when, we're, when the drug companies are looking for a new antidepressant, the thing that they look for is, is this going to not raise serotonin or dopamine or norepinephrine like we used to, but is this going to raise our BDNF levels? Because BDNF is an antidepressant as well as fertilizer. It's an anti-anxiety agent as well as optimizing our brains to 
learn, to grow, to change. So it is really sort of, it, it is what I, I said it was. It is sort of the, the miracle grow. It is the, the magic to regulate our brain. Now we know there are so many other growth factors, so many others that, that we activate when we exercise, when we use our brain cells and when we use our muscles. Now we're learning this whole transfer of information from our bodies when we're using our muscles, up to our brain. Not just BDNF, which we make it all in the brain as well as in the body, but all these other growth factors that when we're using our bodies, when we're exercising, when we're moving, when we're standing, we are demanding that our, our muscles grow, demanding that our, mus our muscles are stressed. So we send out these factors, these growth factors to help us build our muscles better and use insulin better so that we bring more glucose to the issue to where it's needed. And, and these factors go up to the brain and are very key and crucial for brain health to activate our brain, to make it feel good. You know, we, you mentioned uh, or, or people mention always the endorphin story. It's not just about endorphins. It's about the, the neurotransmitters. It's a, certainly the endorphins, are, which are made both in the body and in the brain to help us deal with pain and to make us feel satiated, make us feel satisfied. But also we know there's another substance that we've only discovered 15 years ago or so called the endocannabinoids, which means our body and our brain's own marijuana factors the endorphins are, are morphine factors. So uh, all the heroin, Oxycontin, all that, we have receptors in our bodies and in our brains and we make it to help us deal with pain and, and disappointment and craving. And so, but we also have this other thing called endocannabinoids and there are papers coming out now saying this may be even more important than the endorphins in making us feel good when we exercise, but there's a whole group of, of factors. And we're learning about new ones every year that are important in making our moods better and, and making our brains work better. But exercise is always at the center of it. Well, one thing that you had brought up that really struck home for me is the idea of depression and retaining information and learning new information. Because this is something that I experienced really, really acutely. And I've actually gone through this twice. I had the bout of suicidal depression about a decade ago. And I wasn't, I didn't have suicidal depression, but I went through a massive about a month or two of absolute burnout and complete crash. And this is less than a year ago. And I wrote about this in a blog post, so I can link to that in the show notes. But I found that I, my, I have almost no memory of what happened during that time because I wasn't retaining information. When I would read something, I would be like, I have no idea what I just read. I didn't understand any of that. And where I've now applied that in a positive way is as a film editor for a living, what I have to do is ingest very large amounts of information on a regular basis. So for a regular episode of television, for example, it's about 42 minutes on TV, but it's over 30 hours of material that I have to wade through and I'll watch three or four hours a day. And when I didn't have any energy and I was dealing with depression, I would just stare at the TV and I'd be done and I would think, I have no idea what I just watched and I just wasted an hour or two watching this footage. But now what I've done is developed these habits. So I am moving intensely only for maybe 60 to 120 seconds at a time, but right before I start to ingest material and watch it. And it has a huge effect on my ability to retain information and remember it. We're going to be weeks later and I can just recall where something was and almost have this moment of, wait, how did I know that? Where did that come from? Like, it's a really bizarre experience. So how, how are just these small bouts of intense exercise linked to this? Because I don't want people to think, well, all this is great, but I'm not going to exercise for 60 minutes a day. I just don't have the time. Right. Well, it's so interesting. Just this past month, a bunch of studies have come out from the Netherlands, okay, looking at kids in schools, because that's where exercise is really, uh, we're bereft of it in most of the world. Uh, we're taking it away, so we think this is going to help raise test scores. In the Netherlands, they're, they're looking at kids while they're moving in the classroom, having them do jumping jacks and push-ups and squats and 
calisthenics and dance and all that, and learning while they're moving, okay? And, and small bouts, four-minute four bouts of, of exercise. They learn better when they're moving, and they learn better when they're done. And they're moving right beside their desk, so they don't even have to move. For instance, in my book, in the, one of the chapters, I talk about a, a woman who was dealing with people who were remodeling her house, and they were way they were a year late in finishing, and she was uh, getting very, very stressed, and uh, she didn't have a kitchen for so long, etc. So she began to drink, and then, so I suggested, and she had been an athlete, and I suggested, well, why don't you start? jumping rope when you feel like you're going, you know, you're overstressed. So she did that and she actually put four jump ropes through her fairly large house. And uh, so that she would, whenever she would have these cravings or this uh, load of stress, she did four or five minutes of jump rope. And I called her jump rope lady in the book. And she uh, was able to stop drinking, was, and then went back to the gym and started playing tennis again and did a, you know, her usual, uh, which had been uh, co-opted by the stress of having uh, her house really redone in a very, very large way. And it, you know, it was the terror of, the, of too much work for the con- construction industry at that point. One doesn't need to get to the gym, you know, walking the stairs, getting up and doing, there's a great app for your phone, there's a seven minute exercise that you can look up and that's what it's called. And it gives you exercises to do for 30 seconds and 10 seconds rest. And you go through a lot of different uh, muscle groups and you really get energized from doing this in just seven minutes. It's not to replace a full gym workout, but uh, people that say they don't have enough time, this is this has been amazing. And I've had people who are doing it uh, once they start, you know, almost every day, or or in fact every day, just to make sure they get that exercise break in. And so one doesn't have to go to the gym. I mean, you know, and come on now with the YouTube and everything, you can go and be led by an exercise or uh, CrossFit as their uh, daily wad or their workout of the day on that doesn't necessarily involve weights that you can do. You can be driven by that or, you know, a variety of different uh, offerings every day and, and, and that are already on there so that you can you can choose one and, and, and do it fairly quickly. These are not like 60 minutes of exercise. And and so what does this do? Well, this causes your brain to acutely change. The chemistry changes in your brain. Well, and I'm, I'm very glad that you brought up the seven-minute apps because this was kind of the beginning of my brainstorm to create this entire online learning system because I had been reaching out to hundreds of people in my industry via email, even via phone, having lunches or dinners with them. And I heard over and over, oh yeah, no, I've I've got you know a, a collection of videos bookmarked on YouTube where I have a seven minute app, but I kind of never use it. And I'm thinking, huh, all right, well, having the routine that's great, but people actually have to learn how to develop the habits, the routines, and build the motivation and develop their why, so they can then plug in those routines. So that's actually what my online learning course is all about: is it's leading you to the point where the routines just become habit, and you don't have to think about it. But I'm so glad that you're reinforcing the idea that yes, first of all, exercise is great for you. You should be exercising. You should be running. You should be going to the gym and doing strength training and high intensity. But if you work 16 hours a day on a project, you can't just think it's all or nothing. I'm either going to the gym or I'm just sitting all day. If you can incorporate these little bits of movement throughout the day, it has a huge impact, not just on burning calories, but on your overall brain health, which is ultimately what you need in a very creative and stressful industry. So I'm I'm very, very glad that you brought up the apps and I'm trying to build something that takes it one step further so people don't just say, well, yeah, I've I've got it. I just never use it or I forget about it or I set alarms and I ignore the alarm. So that's kind of the, the step that I'm taking on. But now that we've really spent a lot of time talking about brain growth and brain health, I want to go in the opposite direction. 
And I don't believe in fear tactics, but I believe in sharing the truth. And this is where I really realize I need to focus on this a lot more. And that is the idea of brain shrinkage and shriveling and how when you are inactive or if you are obese, it's literally lowering your cognitive function and shrinking your brain. Yeah, no, that's that's what we know. And we've known about it and we've talked about it, but now we're it's out there so the world knows that this being our sedentary lifestyles and our being sedentary and being uh, inactive really creates uh, the right environment for your brain to shrink and go away, for your cells to erode, for them to get thinner and not as connected and them not to give it to get as tough. It's just like the atrophy that you see with your muscles when you don't move them. You see the same thing with your brain cells. So and being, uh, I mean, the, 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 this whole revolution started out in California. You see Irvine in the 90s when they looked at these mice running and their brains were thicker and their hippocampus were bigger and all that. But and what they showed was that this is a way of preserving our brains, keeping our brains from shrinking and going away. And it was all driven by the realization that the boomers – who were coming on, were going to be entering the 60 plus in, in a big wave as we're doing now. And we need to really try to understand how to stop this inevitable brain decline and, and so forth. And now we have lots of evidence showing that the healthier you are, the fitter you are, the smarter you are. The healthier you are, the more, more optimal your weight is, the better your brain works and the better it's going to work for a longer period of time. Just so so I can absolutely clarify with 100% certainty, I have a clinical psychiatrist at Harvard that's saying movement makes you smarter. Is is that accurate? Oh, yes. Yes, it absolutely is. And And I'll give you a great example. And that's a study that came out of Sweden a few years ago, looking at an epidemiologic study looking at 1.2 million boys over a 26-year period. They keep all these records there. And, and they tested the kids when they entered high school at the age of 15. They tested both the boys and the girls. They tested them aerobically, that is, how much endurance they had. They tested their muscle strength. They tested their IQs and their performance on cognitive exams. Well, the boys all were retested when they were 18 and entered compulsory military service. And what they found that is if you improved your fitness level, if you got better aerobically, your IQs went up. You, they followed these guys after the military service, those that improved during high school, their fitness level, their aerobic level, their, their ability to endure activity, they had a higher academic standing, meaning more degrees, and then eventually the same group had a higher socioeconomic standing. So what does this mean? This means that being fit made their brains better, made them smarter. And this held, which was really great for somebody in the sciences, this held for 650 sets of identical twins. So if one of the twins, they started out the same, but if one of the twins got fitter, in high school and the other one didn't, their IQs got higher. So when you see something like that, you go, oh my God, this is real, as real as real could be. And their conclusion on the study is that the Swedish government is that you, we should be increasing the time spent in physical training, physical activity, not just sports, but physical activity for all, because it made our country smarter and it's, beginning to happen, although it's, uh, it, it's, it's in fits and starts. But it really is true that you're, you're in California, you know, since 2000, you've tested in the schools in grades five, seven, and nine, a million kids a year and evaluated them on a thing called the fitness gram, which is basically six different fitness standards. Well, what they found and what they find every single year the more fitness standards you meet, 
the better your scores are on those horrible no child helped at all tests that all these kids have to take the no child left behind tests. Better the scores are, or the, or the more fitness standards you meet, the better your scores are going to be. So it's a straight line graph of of increasing scores in both math and language arts. Well, it's, it's funny that you brought up the, the I, I love the way that you put that, the, the no child helps at all. That's pretty amazing. So clearly I know where you stand politically, um, <laughs> but I think it's, it's, it's funny where you talk about the idea of being more sedentary is actually shrinking your brain and slowing down your cognitive function. This is not scientific, but I think, and this is me going off on a complete tangent, but if you look at what's happening with our society today, especially in the political sphere, and I'm not saying anything about any particular candidates on any side, but you just see the degradation of human decency and humanity in talking about the real issues, and I firmly believe that that has a level of connection with our lack of movement and mobility in this country and how everybody is so sedentary. Right. Here's something that d- despite what's happening in, in the political arena now, you know, and despite ISIS and, and all the other hate out there, I think what's happening that I see and what I know is happening uh, because I feel it, I'm involved in so much, but just this past couple of years, it's finally getting to the point where we're approaching a tipping point where, you know, you're starting a whole wellness kind of thing for the brain and for people in general. This is happening everywhere. It, it's happening. People are being more attuned to it. Look at the huge growth of CrossFit and the huge growth of Soul Cycle. And, you know, one in 10 of us in the States are having a yoga class this week. 10% of, the, of people in the United States are in one yoga class this week. That's incredible when you think of uh, yoga. You know, a lot of people aren't doing it, but there's a lot that are. That's the point. And and that means that they're appreciating the body, mind, brain interaction. And, and we're seeing this happen. And the kind of new, trying to use technology to help us do what you want to do to make our brains work better for us. It's happening. It is happening. I'm going out to California next week. I'll be flying out there. And you're in, in both Southern California and in Silicon Valley meeting with groups, two groups that are committed to using artificial intelligence and another one, just just the knowledge and how to, how to get people, the elderly moving but how to remind people what they want to do and, and your particular thing about, uh, uh, about uh, the seven-minute exercise and reminding people, the, the movement to move better and move more often started a long time ago, but really was picked up at the University of Michigan about 10 years ago and studied and now uh, written about that the focus shouldn't be on long-term goals, like exercising to lose weight is not going to be great if that's all you do. It's not going to happen that much. It does about 15% will, will come from your exercising, but it's really about diet change for losing weight. But that's not the effect that, you're, that is important to hold on to. What's important to hold on to is how you feel that day that you've exercised. It's looking at it and remind, like you said, people forget about it, but reminding yourself what you felt like, why you do it, how much better you are today, how much more editing you can do, for instance, how much more you can do, how much pleasanter you are, you know, how much more loving you are and, and more civil, like you're implying. And all that is true, and, 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 and so we need to remind ourselves of this constantly. Yeah, and that's really what I'm trying to emphasize as well, is that if you look at it only long term, you're ultimately going to fail because you're thinking, well, I had this one day where my exercise calendar said I should do a 60-minute HIIT workout and eat this many macros of protein, carbs, and carbohydrates, and fats, and well, I just didn't do it today, so I give up. 
And what I'm trying to teach people is it's not about the long-term goal, it's about establishing a system. Because if you have a system in place where it's, well, I'm gonna do this in the morning, I'm gonna do this at 11 o'clock, and I have all these apps talking to each other, and I just, I'm kind of automating all these things for myself, you miss one day, who cares? The system is still in place and you start tomorrow, and your goal is, I just want to feel better, I wanna have more clarity in my work, I wanna be able to work faster and more efficiently, and the side effect of all of those is you feel much better and you lose weight and you get in better shape. So it's, it's kind of the, the reverse psychology model of really breaking it down into a system and not looking at, I'm going to lose 90 pounds in 90 days. Like that, that thinking is just crazy. And we have proven beyond the shadow of a doubt that does not work. And that's why people make so much money off of it because people are looking for the next quick fix. So that being the case, I want to be very respectful of your time because we're just about done. But before I lose you, if somebody's listening to this and they're convinced now that movement really is going to make a difference in their lives, what's a, a couple of really small things that they can do to get started right away without heavy investment or being overwhelmed? Well, no, but that's, that's why I think what, what I mentioned, the seven-minute exercise, get it on your smartphone. Whatever it is, it it it's it was developed at the Human Performance Institute in in Orlando with Jim Lohr, who's sort of the first sports psychologist, really, and he's a wonderful group and a wonderful the the leaders in in this area, and they developed this, and it's you know in the New York Times and all, all over, all over. It's very popular and it's free. It's free. Put it on your smartphone. And it will lead you through a series of different exercises, jumping jacks, push-ups, squats, lunges. And, and it's, it's, it's only seven minutes, so it ends quick. Uh, you know, it, it's not something that you'll fail at. So, and then, then, of course, uh, you know, for most people, you, you got to walk before you run. So, um, we're, you know, there, there's so many programs out there, the walk run program. And I just was reacquainted with that by, uh, the Disney people They're they're all into uh, getting people to do a marathon, but it's, it's walk, run, walk a little bit, run a little bit, then walk. So you're not overstraining your muscles as well as not, you know, you're building up your wind gradually. You walk so you can run. So, you know, so you entertain these things gradually. You don't think that you're going to go out and run a 5K if you if you're just sitting on the couch all the time. You know, you're you're not going to do it. So you walk a 5K. You can probably do that, but uh, if you can't, you just walk a little bit, and and then you see yourself. And, and using the technology that we have today is just amazing. What we can can do with the Fitbit and all that we can know what our heart rate is, know what our number of paces, yada, yada, yada. And you can, I, I, I see a lot of progress with people with the Fitbit because they'll get, you know, there's this magic 10,000 steps. They'll get their 10,000 steps in. They'll go out and it, when they come home and say, oh my God, I've only had 6,000 steps today. So they'll go out and they'll walk around the block until they hit the, that uh, 10,000 steps or near enough. So, you can use these digital markers to help guide you, but you still have to be committed to it. And and I would say read my book, Spark, because it will turn you on to the, the incredible benefits of exercise for your mood, your addiction proneness, your stress level, your ability to forestall cognitive decline and aging from your brain's perspective, but you know, it, it, it really is a reinforcer uh, of all good habits. Yeah, I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes to Spark, which is the whole reason that I found you. I will put driven to distraction on my reading list, but I may get distracted and not read it. I don't know. I may forget and get caught up in too many things. Well, um, no, but you know, yeah, listen to it. Listen to it. Yes. Online. Yeah, no, that, that is how I do it. I actually have a very hard time reading. Reading comprehension was always my lowest scores in school. Just a horrible time reading. But if I listen, it's literally like photographic memory and I pick up so much information. But if I read, I retain nothing. So it is actually how... 
I found you and how I ingest everything is because I'm in my car for two to three hours a day and that's how I, I get all my information. But I will definitely link to your books and your website as well. And I cannot thank you enough for being on this show today. I really hope that this has helped people realize that exercise and movement are about a lot more than calories in, calories out and making their waist smaller. It's actually about making your brain larger and feeling better. So this has been a tremendous pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on, Zach. Thank you for listening to episode 71 of the Fitness and Post podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to access any of the resources discussed, visit our show notes at fitnessandpost.com slash 71. This episode is sponsored by Cinemodi. Cinemodi produces high quality, royalty free and post friendly second unit stock and visual effects footage for filmmakers. Let's say that you have a restaurant scene, but you just don't have enough activity in the shot. Need some additional extras? Cinemodi has the footage for that. Or maybe you need to add some three-dimensional depth to a flat shot. Want to add a defocused tree branch in the foreground? Cinemodi has that too. Their flagship second unit post-friendly footage features live action visual effects content that can easily and affordably add production value and polish to your next project. You can find their second unit collection at cinemodi.com. That's C-I-N-E-M-O-T-I dot com. This episode is sponsored by editstock.com. Editstock provides high quality uncut film footage for those who want to learn or practice the art of video editing. This cool service offers raw footage from a variety of genres, including action, comedy, sports, and documentary. So you can pick the same kinds of projects you're looking to get hired for. You know the frustration of needing a reel to get a job and then needing a job to get a reel? EditStock solves this old chicken and egg problem by allowing you to use your cuts for your demo reel. EditStock is ideal for assistant editors trying to move up, editors transitioning to a new style or genre, and people who are brand new to editing. EditStock can even give you professional feedback on your work. Best of all, every time you buy raw footage on EditStock, 30% of the purchase goes to the filmmaker who created it. So you can help these indie directors earn back their budgets. Multi-user educational licenses are also available. Visit EditStock.com to download a free sample scene and use the code FITNESS to save 10% on your order. Thank you for listening. Be well.